Guys, cooked in the in the chat for CJ. CJ's getting cooked. Before we continue with today's video, guys, I want to highlight today's sponsor, and that is me. I built this platform called GetCrack.io, and I did it because I noticed that there was a really large gap between what candidates need to know in terms of the knowledge-related questions and what candidates know, which is effectively only lead code. Now that companies are moving away from lead code, this is going to be the platform that you want to invest a lot of your time in. There's a bunch of different topics ranging from language knowledge, operating systems, networking, design patterns, concurrency, etc., and you can really test and hone your skill set here. So if you're competitive, you want to see how well you know Python or C++ or operating systems, this is a platform for you. So make sure to check it out. Yeah, hey CJ. So I just, um, what I wanted from you is, I had an interview recently, I think two weeks back, uh, where I was asked on a computer architecture question and I couldn't really figure it out. Uh, so I just wanted to see how your thought process goes, if that's fine. Sure, you. yeah, what's the role for? So it was for a uh, GPU driver role. Um, That's not my forte, but okay. But it's still, it's, it's not related to GPUs. It's only, the question was only related to computer architecture. Okay. So uh, it started off with this, right? So you have a theoretical scenario where uh, you have two CPUs, CPU A and CPU B, yeah. which are connected by a memory bus and they have one single physical frame connected to them, right? And each CPU has their own OS. The CPU A is running its own OS. CPU B is running its own OS. So it's not a shared OS. It's a theoretical, hypothetical scenario. And when you say they have their own physical frame, you're talking about like a page frame? What? Well, I don't know. Right, okay. a page frame. That's correct. Okay. So they have a common frame which is shared among uh, the bus, and the bus is connected to CPU A and CPU B. And each CPU B and CPU B uh, have their own OSs. Okay. So this was the setup that was given, and the question was, um, so they said that uh, CPU A is going to be the producer, and CPU B is going to be the consumer, right? And your CPU A uh, can only produce one thing at a time, uh, meaning there cannot be two things in the queue or something, and then the consumer consumes two things. So, so CPU A is going to produce one thing, CPU B is going to consume that, and then CPU is going to produce the next thing, and CPU B is going to consume that. Okay. So the question was, uh, it was an open-ended question, that how would you go about designing such a thing? So I just want to know how your thought process, or what are you thinking, and what direction are you going, or anything. So I try to think about it at a level that I'm more comfortable in because as you move lower and lower, the same abstractions apply. So when I'm thinking mm -hmm. of this, and let's say I'm thinking about like a C++ program, I'm thinking of a producer queue and a consumer queue or a producer thread and a consumer thread. I'm trying to think about it at a higher level first and then try to work my way down. So you might have mm -hmm. a producer which places something in a queue and then it gets popped from the queue by the consumer. Now, in order to prevent memory uh, uh, data races, you need a, what you need a lock, Correct. right? That's right. So right. you have two threads that share the same processor space, but they both need to have exclusive ownership of it when they are performing a given operation. So when thread A produces and pushes onto the queue, it needs to acquire a lock and then it needs to release the lock once it's free. Now, you can also use a condition variable here after you're done freeing, after you're done pushing to signal to the other thread that there's now something in the queue. Now, let's try to take that information and bring it down a level lower. So now we're talking about like operating systems and CPUs and a shared memory bus with a page frame. So effectively, the same sort of construct can apply at a lower level in this, in this sort of parallel. Um, the page frame is effectively where they're writing and reading to. I think there is some certain Linux commands for shared memory. Um, I think it's shmem or something. Anyways, um, that page frame needs to be written to by the producer, and then the consumer needs to read from it. Now, the producer, when it writes to it, needs to acquire a certain lock on that page frame to tell the consumer right, right. that now you can't, you can't be reading while I'm writing. I don't right, know actually, the exact yeah. sort of answer they're looking for for what sort of construct they are looking for at that lo low level of locking right, that page right. frame. Um, but 
but that that would be the approach that I'd take, and then I'd slowly kind of like yeah. flesh out my idea there. Yeah, that was that was uh, that aligns with what I told them as well. I told them that you do a, a kind of a semaphore where uh, the CPU A writes to the shared map, shared frame, and so when I said this, they also told that uh, the shared frame, the payload for the producer is only going to take half the page. So if you have a four kilobyte page, the payload is going to take only two kilobytes, and you have the two kilobytes free. They gave this additional information, and when I told them that you can use a semaphore where CPU A writes and then signals to CPU B that something has been written, and CPU B can consume, but they added additional constraints that you can let's just assume that there's no um, no locking or like no atomic supported by the right. CPUs to right, do semaphores. So I gave them another solution which you can use interrupts. So CPU A can send an interrupt and when it's written and CPU B as an interrupt service routine can access that. But they tell, uh, they told that, um, let's just assume there's no interrupts as well. How would you just do it using just pure shared frame and two CPUs which wants to produce and consume? So the, the first producer CPU effectively writes to half of the space that's available? Right, so the payload can take at most half. So you have the other half of the page free. Free in, for what? You can do whatever you want with it. I see. So that's really the trick that they're trying to pull your brain on. They're effectively asking, like, what will you do with the other half of this page frame that will help signal to the consumer that it is now ready to consume from the first half of the page? Maybe there's some sort of involvement of like a dirty bit. So once the page has been written to, then there is a bit on the other half of the page frame that is now marked as one instead of zero. Now, the right. only issue there is that you still have the concurrent read and write problem. So you might be writing that dirty bit and reading from it at the same time, um, which might is still a, a sort of a race condition. So I'm trying to think about how I would synchronize the read of that empty space that has a signal bit with the, the write from the producer CPU. But... Um, I can't think of something yeah. at the moment. Actually, I told them the same thing as well. So I, I told them that you can have a bit, which is, let's say, zero or one to indicate whether if it's written or, or, or like the producer has produced something and the consumer has consumed something. So uh, I also told them additional information like, uh, let's say your producer code would look like you poll for the bit. And once you uh, see that bit is zero, you write the payload to the first half and then you update the bit to one and uh, once you update the bit to one the consumer can read that bit and then consume the payload yeah but they, they also told that uh, assume that the two cpus have caches right so what sort of problems could this be and uh, how the cpu executes those instructions that you told so consider caches and consider how the cpu executes and what sort of problems can this be so this is what they followed up on how would the consumer code look like? Yeah, based on the same information, like... Uh, I, I'm you, assuming you, they're asking you to describe it at a high level as opposed to like give them the exact like x86 instruction set. Uh, yeah, so okay. for uh, for the producer side, you would have uh, write the payload, uh, execute fence instruction, write the bit, flush the cache. So these yeah. are four instructions, right? So similarly, they wanted something on the consumer side. How would it look? Okay, when I'm thinking of this on like the C++ level, I'm thinking of, of two things. I'm thinking of uh, you first have a read only of that bit in a relaxed state. So you're, it's an atomic operation with memory order relaxed, meaning all you care about is atomicity. You don't care about any sort of synchronizes with um, correct, correct, right. ordering, memory ordering. So you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading, you're reading. Yeah. And then you get the actual value, let's say one being that it has been set. Oftentimes this in C++ is called mm -hmm. test and set. And then the right. next operation is once you've read it as one, meaning true, and now you end it with another operation. So you only run the second operation if the first operation returned one. Because if it was zero, zero is false. And that's the importance of knowing Correct. that. And when people say, why do I need to know an integer is a Boolean or a Boolean is actually an integer under the hood? That's why. Okay, so right. it reads zero, not in the end, the part B of the end doesn't execute. It reads one. Now we start uh, the evaluation of the part B of the end. What's the second evaluation in the end? It's a compare exchange operation. So what it's saying is, if the value is what I expect it to be, which is one, then uh, modify and then replace it with zero. So you're doing that, that 
that operation, that compare exchange, allows you to signal that you've read it, you've consumed the, the data that you want to, and you've written back to it that it is now zero and the other producer can now do whatever it wants with the page frame. Instead of writing back zero, because zero would effectively mean to them that they can now overwrite the shared page. Mm -hmm. Instead of writing back zero, I might actually not just focus on one bit. I might actually focus on, we're, we're working with like word sizes. So I might actually write the number two to that byte in memory. And that would mean that I'm currently operating on that data. Do not touch, do not write. So that compare right. exchange would expect a one. If there's a one, replace it with two and then true is returned because what we expected to be there was there. We return true, we wrote back two, and now we're executing whatever it is in our if statement that is being pulled in a loop. And at the end of that if statement, we then write back with the um, atomic ordering and not relaxed. So it was, I think it's requ acquire release. Acquire release right so right. now we release back, we release back a zero. Right, so this is, yeah, that, that, that kind of makes sense. This is similar to what I told. So I told instead of zero, one, and two, I told you could have the producer will have states like producing, produced, consumer will have states like consuming, consumed. You can represent right. it however you want. Right. Right. So uh, the final question they had was so with this, uh, let's say the consumer has consumed and it has updated the state to tell that it is consumed. Now the producer is going to produce a new payload. So now when the consumer reads it, what could go wrong? What about the payload that it reads? What could go wrong there? This is what they asked. Say that, sorry, so, say that part again. So after the consumer is done consuming. Yeah, so after the consumer has consumed it, uh, it it's going to update the state to reflect that it is consumed, right? Right. Somehow, let's just say it uh, writes a bit two with uh, the acquire and release. So it would release two, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so now the producer is going to read that and it's going to update it with a new payload and update the state back to one. Mm -hmm. right? Now, when the consumer is reading this, um, what, what could go wrong with what the consumer is reading? What about the payload that it's reading? So what could go wrong here? This is what they asked me. And this is where I got it wrong. So. so the producer has now written a fresh uh, piece of information to the shared page. And, right. it's, and it's changed its flag to set. So one. Right, right. So I think what they're effectively asking you here is the interaction between the cache in the consumer, which has already read uh, a previous iteration, and the newly written to payload. Because they wouldn't follow up with this question unless uh, they, they're not following up with this question until you've already answered the question where the consumer has read. So they're effectively asking yeah, you what no. side effects are now present after right. the consumer has read. Um, so they must be thinking of effects on caching. Yeah, that that is that is the right direction. I'm just trying to brain dump in my head about this caching stuff. Okay, uh, one thing that I can think of, uh, well, it applies to the first case as well. Can can the data that's written to the payload fit in the CPU's cache? Uh, yes, uh, yes, let's just say yes, it can fit in the cache. Guys, cooked in the in the chat for CJ. CJ is getting cooked. Cooked emojis in the Sorry. chat. No, no, it's fine. This is a good question. Um, I'm just trying to think. I'm trying to think. Maybe some sort of cache coherence or cache affinity issues. Um, can you give me a hint? Um. Yeah. It's it's basically going to read some old data so what how would you fix that why would it read old data if the entire payload is new what do you mean yeah that, that, that's the thing why, why would it read old data that's what i couldn't figure it out actually unfortunately i didn't get the job 
Okay. Um, well, interesting. These sorts of questions, I don't, I don't think a lot of the times they're looking for a direct answer. I think they are looking to see how you think and what you know. Yeah, actually, at this point, they were like, um, uh, it's, uh, we're running out of time, let's go to the coding question. And then they told me the answer that's like, so every time you poll for the uh, bit, you need to actually invalidate the cache because once you write the bit as two, uh, you're actually writing it to cache first and then you write it to the mem frame. So the next time you read, you're going to actually read from the cache and the state will always be two because you just wrote it there. So essentially what they were looking for is every time you poll uh, the frame, you actually have to invalidate the cache and uh, read from the main physical frame because any updates to the frame will not be reflected in the cache. Yeah, I get the point. I guess that's why in the beginning they told that uh, your CPU A and CPU B have two different OSs, maybe to avoid this, because if it's in the same OS, they'll have something like cache coherence protocol, which says that whatever's there in the cache is invalid and you have to read from memory. But ah. I guess I, I'm just, I don't know, maybe that's why. Because you have two different OSs, there's no way of communicating across the two CPUs that the, whatever CPU B had in cache is invalid. So you would have to manually invalidate the cache. Assuming that you're programmed the CPUs for the producer-consumer model, you'd have to manually invalidate the cache and read from frame. 